Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon. Bienvenue à la conférence en ligne protégée et promouvoir la diversité des expressions culturelles dans les environnements numériques. Protecting and promoting the diversity of cultural expressions in the digital environment. I'm Bill Skolnick in Toronto, the co-chair, co-president of the Coalition for the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, la Coalition pour la Diversité des Expressions Culturelles. Few instructions before we get going. There will be traduction simultanee. Pour suivre l'événement dans votre langue, cliquez sur le bouton interprétation situé dans les barres inférieures et cliquez sur la langue. Simultaneous translation for everyone to listen to the event in the language of your choice. Select interpretation and click on the language. Slides are available in English and French. French, click on view options at the top of the screen. Presentation. En anglais et en français, cliquez voir option en haut de l'écran. There are two communications channels. One is entitled chat. And that's where you have to talk to your colleagues, chat during the, uh, the entire conference. And the other one is question and answers. That, please reserve that for the ends of the sessions and questions and answers at that time. N'hésitez pas à clavarder. Il y aura une période de questions à la fin. Founded in 1998, the Coalition for the Diversity of Cultural Expressions brings together Canada's principal francophone and anglophone professional organizations in the cultural sector. These 40 organizations include trade associations, guilds, collective societies, and unions. They represent more than 200,000 people working for 2,000 entities in the cultural industries. These folks are the creators, performing artists, technicians, producers, managers, editors, executives, publishers, and distributors in the book, film, television, new media, music, performing arts, and visual arts sectors. The responsibility la plus important de la coalition est peut-être la protection et la promotion. The most important responsibility of the coalition is protection and promotion of diversity of expression, of cultural expression that was adopted in UNESCO in 2005. This obligation is now more important than ever. And that's why we're here today to maintain this vision. So digital environment is not control. It's a big threat to local cultural expression. So we will need to write something to really define properly how to protect this culture. So we have, of course, uh, sometimes with our uh, neighbor on the southern border, it's easy to be close-minded, but we need to be open-minded and open to every country in the world. So we're united here today under the symbol of the UNESCO and the FDCDC to share our knowledge and our experience and to prepare how each country and each culture that's represented here in this conference has their own vigilance to protect their culture and in the and how they use the digital environment to strengthen this protection but before we start i want to let uh, veronique uh, uh, speak hello everyone good morning good afternoon so it's my turn to welcome you here to this conference since 2016 this year at least some research uh, with the on the following the 2005 convention on promotion and protection of cultural diversity uh, this is a partner of the chair for many years now so one of the principles here of this chair is to adopt and put into place cultural uh, politics it's a topic that is now uh, a very big issue about digital technology so we've led many research projects that are i want to target the best practices that are going all over the world to protect and promote uh, the, the diversity of cultural expression so we looked towards 
Europe, and we've seen what they've done in 2018. And we also looked at their state members that are transposed this in their uh, national uh, policies. And then we looked at other countries uh, as we looked also at Asia, Africa, South America, and so on. So I would like to take a moment to greet all the students and all the members of the chair and a special thanks to Clemence Varin, who was very involved in the organization of this event. So after these few research years, you will know that it's with great pleasure that today we have all our panelists and several of them are long colleagues and friends. And these panelists will share their experience, their vision and their uh, critical view about the cultural policies especially as it relates to the digital environment. It's such an important topic for Canada and for a lot of other states. It's a question of cultural sovereignty. And for each individual, for each of us, these reforms will be necessary to guarantee the respect of our protection and the uh, protection of our uh, rights that need to be respected in the digital environment. So I will now leave the floor to a long colleague. We've often met in the UNESCO rooms and other forums to uh, cultural diversity expression, the president of the Federation of the International Community for the Cultural Expression. He's also secretary general and also a musician. So now I will leave the floor to Mr. Piacent. Thank you, Veronique. Good afternoon, maybe even good evening or good night to everybody. <clears throat> the International Federation of Coalitions for Cultural Diversity is the voice of cultural professionals around the world. It brings together some 30 national coalitions from all five continents representing all the categories of cultural actors that Bill Skolnick has already named before for the Canadian coalition. I won't repeat that. The IFCCD was created as a result of a major mobilization of civil society in favor of the adoption, ratification and implementation of the 2005 UNESCO <clears throat> Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. Today, our mission is to coordinate civil society efforts for the implementation of this convention in both the analog and digital environment. Although the production, dissemination and consumption of cultural goods and services have been shifting to and making use of the digital environment since many years, legislation that ensures the protection and promotion of its diversity is constantly leaping behind the technological developments. I'll give you two examples. Example one, the value gap. Appraised by consumers, zillions of cultural expressions are streamed or broadcast to the world every day. But many artists and performers still lack a decent remuneration for their working contribution to all of this. Example number two, the discoverability. Let's say you'd like to find music from Togo on Spotify. You may be surprised to find that there's no way to search for this on a globally leading music platform. The only results will be tracks with Togo in the title. Sad news for those who'd like to be able to discover local content. These are just two examples why we at the IFCCD are very keen on learning about progress of legislation addressing these or similar deficiencies and why we are partners in today's conference. Thank you. I'll hand back to Bill. Merci. The program du matin pour uh... So the program for Montreal for this morning and this afternoon the present, the, will be presented by Eugenie, the roundtable one about the uh, 
uh, law C10 in Canada, and then in roundtable two, it will be about the media services in Europe and how it applies to the member states. We, we uh, take a little break for a couple hours and we return around 2.30 p.m., 14.30 uh, Montreal time again for the second round table hosted by Kate Taylor. And that will be Africa, Latin, and Atna, Africa, Latin America, and Asia Pacific round table number three, a look at Latin America and Africa, followed by a short discussion on national content, discoverability measures, and trade liberali liberalization issues. And finally, round table four, trends in the Asia Pacific region, and a conclusion with Peter Grant and Natalie Gay to end the whole conference. So please welcome the animator for the uh, round table. The show, Tout en Matin, which is found on EC Premiere and hosted by Patrick Masbourian. Yuzeni, s'il vous plaît. Merci beaucoup, Bill. Bonjour, tout le monde. Thank you, Bill. I see that there's people from all over the world, so it's great to be so well connected on such an important topic. So I'm from Montreal right now, so it's a pleasure to be, to feel this connection, even if it's only a virtual connection. I'm very happy that we are on this round table on the Canadian system reform, what we call the C10 law. So the objective of this round table is to give an overview of the law on the radio diffusion of the information, especially on several topics. So how to promote this culture, how we can make it easier, how we can promote linguistic differences, how we can uh, bring more algorithmic responsibility to all of this. So lots of important topics to discover in the next minute and the next hour. So the C10 law project was uh, put in place in uh, November 2020. It gave some hope and there was a lot of steps. It also generated a lot of debates in a civil society and in the media. But this project uh, in August 2021 uh, kind of uh, faded off uh, after the election. So the Trudeau government wanted to, to have a new law project. So in the first 100 days, so uh, this deadline ends next week. So today we have three panelists that will explain and talk about what I've the topics I named a few moments ago, uh, some people that are much more uh, well-versed in the, all the details of these projects here. So the Catibel, the professor of the Montreal University, uh, Pia will explain uh, what the... Uh, what the overview of these projects and what the C10 law project wanted to put into place and what were the obligations of the various businesses that they will have to respect. Then Monica Auer, directive, director, executive director of the Fount of the Organization. And Monica will look at all the limits of this law and how the CRTC can apply this and even if it's very technical, it's going to be very accessible for the for everyone in the audience. And there, there will be an Diego president for the cultural expression here of the AKPM, of the Expression Québécoise. And then we'll present the position of the CDC on this law project. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this morning. So Pierre, we asked you to begin. So once again, I want to repeat, if you have any questions, there will be a question period at the end. You can write the questions in the chat. So I see people from all over the world are saying hi in the chat. So you can raise your hand and there will be a question period at the end. So yeah, go on. Thank you, Eugenie. So hello, everyone. So thank you, everyone 
for being here. So these are crucial issues moving forward. So what I propose is that I start about the Canadian uh, uh, process here on the legislative front. So in 2018, the Canadian government uh, put into place an expert group that had for a role to look at the situation of the communication space in Canada. So historically in Canada, uh, we always wanted to bring a good space, a Canadian cultural space that's distinct from the American cultural front. So the diversity preoccupation is part of our Canadian tradition and we take inspiration for, from this uh, history. And that's how the Yale com committee went all over Canada to see that the legislation on radio broadcasting, which dates back to 1991, was getting a little bit old and it was applied for two decades. Uh, extremely was a, was put in, in practice very well because even though new emerging services online were targeted by the law, the CRTC uh, was not quite as uh, expertly put into place and it, did, it excluded these services because it's, they said that these services were not part of the, um, were, would not be a very important part of the fusion. So the Yale committee that this failure to put into place the law for the online new technology ways, Sound is unaudible for the interpreter. So this brought a lot of unfairness in the media environment. And to uh, remedy this inequity, the Yale committee recommended to the government to put into place a, um, a fair new law to make sure that all the players played on an even field as far as cultural content goes. And this would assure that the cultural diversity would be respected properly. <clears throat> and to make sure that Canada would reinvest part of what needs to be put there in the production side, on the Canadian production that reflects this Canadian diversity. Um, excuse me, Pierre, there's been a bit of lag. There's been a, there's been a bit of technical issue here. Could you perhaps repeat the last point that you mentioned because it, it cut off a little bit. Uh, something about the production, uh, we missed something. So essentially, the, the Yale report wanted to modernize this fundamental principle for all the businesses, no matter that they be Canadian or non-Canadian, all businesses that get revenue in the Canadian market would need to reinvest part of this in the production of Canadian broadcasting to serve the Canadian public. So it's from this principle That's why they made the C10 law. 
And that's why we need to update these old law. And this new law is about a series of principle. And they want to update the radio broadcasting industry to put into place the new measures that want to give life to these principles that are mentioned in the law. So the law project C10 proposed to include in this uh, radio broadcasting law, the businesses online uh, by creating a new business category, those that broadcast over internet. And now they will be submitted to the these businesses will need to uh, apply to uh, these measures will need to be applied to the businesses that are sufficiently big to uh, deserve such um, rules and they will need to respect the uh, directives of these new laws to put in place this new radio broadcasting measure so this law I also wanted to review this, these policies to better reflect the cultural diversity in Canada, most notably the indigenous communities, which in Canada are have very often been put aside. So for this law project, we wanted to update the law to reflect the uh, measures associated with the uh, diversity in Canada and the uh, diversity as well in the uh, in the indigenous communities. Of course, the other minorities for the other minorities as well, for, but also for French and English or the uh, distinct issues, but often convergent between the uh, media environments in Canada and uh, Canadian English and French. So this law project also wanted to assure a fair treatment, something that would be fair for all the businesses that are controlled in Canada and those that do business in Canada and that collect some revenue on the Canadian market to make sure that All of this and to make sure that proper penalties were there for those who uh, disobeyed the, the law and so that they would uh, have to respect the law. And of course, it also added some uh, power to the uh, some uh, monitoring power and information sharing powers as well to properly apply the law and to make sure that the algorithms follow the law as well and to make sure that data and massive data uh, is uh, also uh, subject to these laws. So this is going to be an important step moving forward for a diversity. We'll need to understand the trends, we'll need to anticipate the trends and eventually to put into place the uh, rules that will need to be put into place to make sure that these objectives uh, for the law are reflected in reality and in the service offer and also in the investments that are made to ensure the production of diversified content that reflects the Canadian diversity. So on the more technical side, there was the C10 law project proposed to introduce this new notion, these uh, internet broadcasting businesses to cover 
the online businesses such as Netflix and others that uh, mainly offer their content online by using uh, internet connections and the other uh, updates uh, in the law are essentially updates to give um, power to the uh, enforcing agencies to put measures in place to uh, and to gather information on all the businesses that participate in the system to make sure that there's proper regulations for everyone. So one thing that was uh, partially reflected in the C10 law that was in the Yale committee project, it was the update of the CRTC and the Yale report proposed to add to the CRTC a series of committee that would ensure a citizen, uh, increased citizen participation to the uh, rule, ruling process that's in the uh, project. So this aspect is not quite as well reflected in the C10 law, but the Yale Commission considered that a key element for to make sure that this is a success means that there needs to have uh, a committee that could be proactive and anticipate trends. So just to make sure that this uh, process is not only applied after the uh, after issues arise. So we need a proactive uh, committee. So I think this is a big overview of the C10 uh, reform that was put into place and that was uh, blocked fundamentally, in my opinion, by a misinformation campaign that was uh, led uh, in certain environments where we, uh, we were where it was said that we wanted to censor people that published on YouTube and so on. So there we go. So that's for this quick C10 law presentation about this topic. All right, thank you so much, Pierre. So I think we understood uh, the connection was getting better. I think we got the uh, essential uh, here. So someone said, could we share the link about the re Yale report? So in the chat, Natalie shared in French and in English, a link to the report. So after this whole day, you can check it out. It's a great read, but it's a very important report. So we have the links here in the chat. So we will move on with Monica Auer. I think you're already off mute, so I leave the floor to you. And thank you to the coalition for inviting me to be part of this panel. As a lawyer practicing in Canadian broadcasting and telecommunications, I'll also be focusing very briefly on some of the changes being proposed to Canada's 30-year-old broadcasting legislation. Pierre has already touched on a number of these. I'll also comment on three aspects of the changes which raise questions. As you probably all know, Canada is a federal state whose national laws are set by Parliament. Parliament enacted the current Broadcasting Act 30 years ago in 1991, so many people believe it's outdated because the internet wasn't even a gleam in Al Gore's eye at that time. Parliament delegated responsibility to implement the Broadcasting Act to the CRTC, which is the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission. It regulates and supervises Canadian radio and television programming services, as well as cable and satellite distribution services. The 91 Act has three basic parts. Part one sets out the broadcasting policy that Parliament established for Canada. Part two empowers the CRTC to license and regulate broadcasters. And part three continues the existence of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, or CBC. Uh, as, as Pierre mentioned, the Minister of Canadian Heritage proposed major changes in November 2020 to parts one and two of the Act, this in Bill C-10. It made no other changes to part three or the CBC. There are rumors constantly that there will be a new part three introduced sometime soon. The House of Commons did pass Bill C-10 in June 2021, but as Eugenie mentioned, its passage through the Senate, which is needed for the Act to become law, was interrupted by a federal election. 
Everybody widely expects now that the new Minister of Canadian Heritage, the Honourable Pablo Rodriguez, will be reintroducing new broadcasting legislation next week when the House begins its new session or soon afterwards. So I'll be touching now on sort of three separate parts, content, discoverability, and, and then regulation. I'm going to be hitting in and out of my remarks because Pierre's already commented on a number of these pieces and I don't want to bore you. Uh, as I said, Section 3 is the key to the 91 Act because it deals with content. So while the 91 Act acknowledges Canada's linguistic duality, BC, BC, C10 goes much further, highlighting the minority context of French in North America. It says the broadcasting system should support the broadcasting and production of original programs in French and that it should enhance the vi vitality of official language minority communities. The 91 Act did say that the broadcasting system should reflect Canada's multicultural and multiracial society nature. Bill C-10 goes a little bit further and require and says that the system should serve the needs of Canadians from racialized communities and Canadians of diverse ethno-cultural backgrounds. So a little bit more precise and up-to-date language. C-10 then also adds that news programs, which are critical to democracy, produced by Canadians should include the viewpoints of Canadians from racialized communities and diverse ethno-cultural backgrounds. Moving on to discoverability, this was not a broadcasting concept in 1991. However, at that time, the key was access. The parliamentarians wanted to ensure that Canadians at least had access to Canadian programming services, and as a result, both the current Act and C10 require cable and satellite distributors to give priority to the carriage of Canadian programming services. Bill C10 then adds that online undertakings that transmit or retrans other broadcasters' programming services, quote unquote, should ensure that these services are discoverable. It emphasizes that online undertakings must clearly promote and recommend Canadian programming in English, French, and Indigenous languages. And it must ensure that any means of control of the programming, in other words, I think we're talking about algorithms that generate results, allow the discovery of Canadian programming. The bill does not define discoverability, so the CRTC may be left to decide its meaning. Moving on to regulation, it's been said by a number of people that Bill C-10 will finally enable the CRTC to regulate online streaming. But the CRTC asserted its jurisdiction over online broadcasting in 1999, more than 20 years ago. At that time, though, as we all know, the internet was very young. Netflix had just launched its online service. And the 91 Act requires, it's mandatory for the CRTC to not regulate broadcasters who cannot help to implement Parliament's broadcasting policy. The CRTC therefore exempted all online broadcasters from regulation. In 2017, though, Netflix agreed to spend half a billion dollars over five years on original productions in Canada. It's clear that this online broadcaster and many others can now contribute materially to Canada's broadcasting policy. But as Pierre noted, the CRTC still exempts online services from regulation. Because they can contribute materially, it really looks as if the CRTC is in breach of the act. But there's a very practical reason that it's doing this. If the CRTC begins to license online broadcasters, it can only license Canadian online broadcasters. This may seem strange because the 91 Act explicitly gives the CRTC jurisdiction over broadcasters operating in whole, like CTV or CBC, or in part, like Netflix in Canada. The reason is that cabinet has used its power under the 91 Act to order the CRTC not to license and therefore not to regulate any foreign broadcasters. Bill C-10 now hints at a new regulatory framework for online broadcasters, but very, very lightly. C-10 keeps the, C the existing licensing powers of the commission, but would allow it to make regulations about the registration of broadcasting undertakings. The CRTC may well then register online broadcasters instead of licensing them. Unfortunately, Bill C-10 does not otherwise explain how registration will work. C-10 retains a number of the CRTC's existing powers over broadcast spending and scheduling, and now empowers it to issue orders about showcasing and the discoverability of Canadian programmings. Most importantly, perhaps from an enforcement perspective, C10 gives the CRTC for the first time the power to fine broadcasters who breach its requirements. 
those fines can be pen, can be heavy. When the CRTC began fining telecommunications company, it started out with a $1 million fine for Belt, Belt Canada. To conclude, Bill C-10 has many positive features. Its emphasis on Indigenous broadcasting, the reflection of Canada's racialized communities, and the availability of broadcast services and programming for official language minority communities is long overdue. Unfortunately, it has more than a few problems. Here are three of them. The first involves accountability. The CRTC collects data about what broadcasters actually broadcast, but doesn't publish any of its results. How then can Parliament and Canadians know if Canada's broadcasting policy is being met? The CRTC's procedures also lack transparency. It does not publish all applications it receives or all the decisions it makes. Its decisions are not signed and it has circumvented the public hearings that are mandated by the current act by holding hearings to which the public is not invited. The 91 Act has not ensured the CRTC's accountability and transparency and neither does Bill C-10. It makes no changes in that regard. A second problem involves the CRTC's independence. The CRTC was the first Canadian broadcaster, broadcast regulator to issue its own decisions. From 1918 to 1967, the government issued licenses. The 91 Act permits cabinet to issue orders to the, to the CRTC on broad policy matters, but C-10 also lets each government's cabinet issue orders to the CRTC about the conditions it imposes on broadcasters about their spending and about the CRTC's regulations, including those for registration. In spring 2021, a draft policy direction that cabinet proposed to issue after C-10 becomes law includes 14 separate directions. Bill C-10 therefore reintroduces political influence into what was formerly, at least from 1968 on, independent decision-making by an independent regulator. Finally, C-10 maintains the CRTC's excessive discretion. It may be useful to know that the current act has essentially 59 separate objectives. Of those 59 objectives, 51 are discretionary. The CRTC is not required to implement them. It may decide whether it will or won't. In Bill C-10, there are now 74 objectives and 60 of these are discretionary. So while Canadians may think that Canada's broadcasting legislation will require broadcasters to reflect the multicultural nature of Canadian society, for example, it will not because Bill C-10 uses verbs like should rather than shall. Granting the CRTC excessive discretion on the one hand and effective freedom from meaningful oversight by the failure to report on results is a legislative recipe for ensuring that Canada's broadcasting policy will not be met by Bill C-10. Thanks. Thank you very much, Monica. It was very clear. I'm taking so much notes so far. I feel like I'm back at university. I love it. Um, thank you. Merci, Pierre. Merci, Monica. Enfin, uh, en terminant, uh, so to conclude, I will represent you because it's a personal deformation. I've learned in uh, French, the CDEC, I you know the Coalition to Dressy of Cultural Expressions. So I'm sorry, Hélène, you were the co-chair of the Coalition for Diversity of Cultural Expressions. Yes, sorry. So Hélène, I leave you the floor. Thank you very much, Eugénie. So I was asked in a few minutes to talk about the concerns of the Canadian Coalition for Diversity of Cultural Expression concerning the Bill C-10, which was tabled at the House of Commons the 3rd of November 2020. I'll try to speak slowly for our interpreters. So offhand, I would say that Bill was well welcomed by all the cultural environment. It was long overdue to modernize the law on broadcasting, which dated from 1991, as it was said. And everybody agreed for the new player, new online players would be integrated into the legislative framework. But a analysis of the C-10 done by the CDCE showed certain gaps in this law. And I will now talk about the gaps in this act. First thing was the scope of the bill. In the bill, they didn't talk about the social media. So as soon as we know that YouTube, for example, is the most popular service in Canada to listen to online music, well, it's important that they fit inside this regulatory framework. 
and social media had been omitted, just as we had omitted the distribution, the digital distribution of the broadcasting in Canada, in the traditional system, some uh, uh, channels have to be provided like APTN, TV5, or you need have to be on the cable companies uh, list. And they have contents which are very important uh, amongst others for native content or content which come from Francophone communities who are in a situation of minority. So obviously these are the concerns of the CDCE for diversity of cultural expressions. This led us to talk about these issues. Now the addition uh, foreign companies in the regulatory framework also led to problems concerning the ownership of the broadcasting system. It said in the 91 Act that the, broad, the Canadian broadcasting system had to be controlled and under the ownership of Canadians. And it is a sentence which disappeared in the new version, the new bill, C-10. Where we also had issues was concerning the recourse to Canadian creators. In the 91 Act, it was said that we had to look at the Canadian creative talent as much as possible or in a preponder uh, prepondering way, majority way, but also because of the introduction of foreign companies, we wanted to tone down this obligation. And I would say later on, the result of our process, our lobbying concerning this. Monica spoke about this. The CRTC plays a fundamental role in the implementation and the oversight of the application of the broadcasting policy. It's the CRTC which will define, for example, the obligations of the Canadian broadcasters as far as expenses and clean content, as far as expenses and natural interest programs, what we call in France, patrimonial uh, broadcast. So it's the CRTC that determines the percentage of French uh, programs, also the percentage that would be given to independent production or the quotas for Canadian music or Francophone music, for example, on the commercial radio stations. So us, we thought that certain mechanisms were missing. And Monica spoke about this. I totally agree with Monica's reflections. Now, one of the elements which was removed and which existed and it was removed in Bill C-10 was the possibility of having an appeal to the uh, governor and council. So a group, uh, the civil society, could uh, make an appeal to the government to ask for a file to be returned to the CRTC to have it to be reviewed. You know, if we had the impression that the CRTC decision did not respect the objectives of the Canadian broadcasting policy, and it's something which had been used by some of the associations of the cultural association amongst other for francophone content, for example, also for diversity of the contents in uh, radio broadcasting or for music or so on. So for us, it was a fundamental element and we no longer find this possibility in Bill C-10. The other thing is the obligation to have public hearings when it's time to determine the conditions for uh, licensees or service conditions, you know, the businesses, whether online or business that are traditional, that was removed this obligation. Now, the CDCE also wanted to strengthen the clauses concerning the French content uh, obligations. Yes, the bill spoke more about native contents, contents from uh, official languages who are in a minority situation, but they still spoke about French content and not necessarily content from original French language, which could create a confusion with content which would be simply translated. So we wanted to make sure to have more obligations for original French language content as opposed to just French language. The other concern was the uh, lowest common denominator because of all this discretionary part of the CRTC and the fact that we introduced new types of corporations, we feared that the obligations, the regulatory obligations would be revisited and lowered. So the wording of the law is very vague and there are notions which can be interpreted in, in very broad ways. For example, it's said that for the services, traditional services and the online services, we have to ensure a fair treatment for 
similar services. Well, what does similar nature of services? A commercial radio, for example, you know, if they have an online music service, are they, do they have a similar nature? How will we compare their obligation between a radio station and a music streaming? So there, there's a lot of leeway, as Monica said, there's a lot of leeway to define all these notions. So, of course, the CDCE tried to obtain modifications, corrections. Some were brought forward in a satisfactory way. The social media were integrated after long and acrimonious debates. So we sure that this question at least will be raised once again in the new version of the bill, which will be tabled, I think, next week. It was very laborious as a process and this raised many questions pierre spoke about this amongst others on the freedom of speech now the digital distribution as i emphasize is something which was solved also through amendments and that were brought to it will it be reintroduced in the new version of course we would like this to be so we also reintegrated articles on canadian ownership and it was added well monica spoke about this the discoverability of Canadian content, of course, it's important if we give obligations to have Canadian content on online platforms with, you know, they have to be discoverable, but also we added obligations of showcasing or French mise en valeur. And that's important too. So the promotion of this content and, and not just this discoverability. Now, concerning the recourse to Canadian talent, as I said, which is a concern that the artists, the producers, they have to find themselves in these Canadian contents that we have to continue to depend on these human resources. The result is a bit confused in the last version of Bill C-10. Canadian corporations still have to call upon them the maximum, at least in a predominant way to creative resources from Canada for the creation or production and the presentation of their programs. But for foreign corporations, it's said that they need to use them as far as possible, which is for us an aberration. It's just a result which is totally unsatisfactory. Now concerning the definition of Canadian content, we managed to integrate a notion of control by Canadians on the intellectual ownership, intellectual property rights and the fact of obtaining a fair and important part of their value. The CDCE would have wanted to go further by obtaining that the CRTC would obtain the powers to have deal with the contractual practices with the between the broadcasting companies and the independent producers to better balance the forces we know negotiations with the giants of the web for example and even with traditional broadcasters is not easy for independent producers you know to retain their intellectual property rights and this we did not obtain it just as we did not obtain the, uh, the, the to get back the appeal to the governor and council which is an important a gap. Now, concerning our fear of general deregulation of the system and that everybody at the end of the process in front of the CRDC would end up with obligations that would be less important, we think that one of the tools of the government is the décret d'instruction. The government substituted the call to the government council after the decisions have been made by saying, I'll more often use the possibility of doing a décret d'instruction to direct the CRTCs on the expected result. So they've drafted a draft of this decree, the directions to the CRTC or... So concerning their intentions to make the system more flexible for everybody, we wanted it to be more eloquent on the importance of having cultural sovereignty, that it was an act that had a goal of protecting the cultural sovereignty of Canada. And it's this whole regulatory system which had allowed Canadians to build a system of broadcasting which protected Canadian content in the, and also the traditional environment and its creators. So we feel that, you know, that we will regain these debates these difficult debates on the new project, we hope that the government will issue as far as soon as possible 
its new directive, which will give to the CRTC, or its draft anyway, it's a draft bill, so that these intentions will be clear, so that they will clearly explain their vision. And it's the desire that we can formulate because there are issues here which are fundamental. We want the direction of the CRTC to be clear, and we want them to say that they don't have the intention of deregulating what is already regulated, but that they would rather want to add new obligations to the corporations who are not currently in the regulatory framework and who play an important role in the ecosystem of broadcasting. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elen. It's really interesting to hear this. This is where we can see, even with what Monica was saying precedingly, just how the devil is in the details. You know, we understand even this even more when we listen to both of you. So thank you very much, Nathalie. I wrote in the chat, uh, we encourage you to ask your questions. There's, there's a Q&A part, uh, Q&A tab. So I'll read right with it. Oh, you can raise your hand also. We have five minutes before going on to the second round table in a few months. We'll take a tiny little break in between both. So somebody wrote, using the cre Canadian creators is put forth for Canadian businesses more than foreign businesses. That's a question. Is it? I don't know who wants to try to answer. Is the recourse to Canadian creators? Uh, that's, uh, I spoke about this question. Yes, indeed. There are two levels of responsibility, and we ask that the obligation to use Canadian creators would be identical, whether for foreign or Canadian companies. When a foreign company, that their obligations would be identical as far as we're using Canadian creative resources, then a Canadian company that produces the same type of uh, content. So we understand that like Netflix, for example, produces content, foreign content in the Canadian lands, you know, maybe there are different obligations, but if it's they produce a Canadian uh, program in Canadian territory, these obligations should be identical to a traditional broadcaster who's a Canadian broadcaster. So this is, we just wanted to make this more fair. Monica, do you want to add something? Answer was really clear. I was looking at the question by Ms. Raventos yes. about the situation for content production quotas and for women and equality. Is there a plan for quotas for women in order to reach equality? I should point out that the CRTC established its first uh, policy on gender portrayal in the late uh, 1980s. And by the early 1990s, the CRTC declared that there was no longer any gender stereotyping and broadcasting. Right. Whether we know that or not, I don't know, but uh, that's what the CRTC said. The act itself does not specify any kind of plan for quotas for employment. And in fact, for large broadcasters, the, there is a separate government department dealing with employment equity. As for content production, again, this is at the CRTC's discretion. It will be issuing orders, presumably, or maintaining its current regulations. All right, thank you. We, Maybe I could add for gender parity is the same thing as for diversity, racial diversity or sexual diversity. The agencies who contribute to the funding of the content, whether it's Telefilm Canada or the Canada Media Fund or even the broadcasters, they have policies concerning this and they will have programs which will foster you know, the reaching of parity in all of, all of its categories. So it's not done through the CRTC, it's done through the funding agencies or through the broadcasters themselves. Okay, thank you. Rhonda Smith, who had wrote while you were speaking, and she's asking the same question. Are there the same rules for traditional radios and online radios, for example? Is it the same rules? Does somebody want to try to answer this? Well, actually, the Yale report is essentially proposed that there would be a fairness between both. Now, see Bill C-10, as Hélène and Monica have discussed, had certain ambiguities concerning this. And it is true that we have, well, we can see a certain hesitancy on the part of the government authorities to really implement a system or a mechanism or a legal framework, which will truly make sure that the businesses, even foreign companies, who participate in the system and amongst others who receive income <laughs> in the Canadian system will behave in a way that is fair 
compared to the other uh, companies, especially the uh, broadcasters that are controlled in Canada. And this ambiguity continues. Uh, it persists, this ambiguity. There are still this trend, which we observe in certain environments, uh, certain governmental environments, to be very sensitive to the pressures that come directly or indirectly from the major corporations, international corporations, who often are very effective to mobilize the so-called sovereignty of consumers or the so-called right of consumers to try to make them be in contradiction with imperatives that are reflected on the Broadcasting Act, you know, imperatives of fairness between the various companies who participate in the system. And it's possibly what explains the relative timidity or the very large ambiguities that we see amongst others in Bill C-10. Oh, one last question, perhaps, Pia, Monica, did you want to say something? If I could just briefly address the question on freedom of expression. Well, that's the other question. The last question I wanted to uh, to address. Well, not myself, but il y a quelqu'un qui demande comment la, le projet de loi. Somebody is asking how C10 could threaten freedom of expression. Monica, you're on. There was a lot of controversy initially uh, about yeah. C10 because it looked as if the CRTC might have been thinking of regulating social media users. I think that. The House of Commons Standing Committee tried to nail that down by saying that the government cannot regulate users, users are not broadcasters. However, nothing prevents the CRTC from regulating social media themselves and then requiring social media to do the work for the government. That's the major concern here. It's, it's uncertain and it's unknown because this is a new area. Yeah. And you should be aware as well that already under the existing broadcasting regulations for both radio and television, uh, the uh, dissemination of hatred, for instance, is completely prohibited. So free, freedom of expression in Canada has limits. It's the old, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. And the same thing is true for broadcasting hate. Mm. Merci. Est-ce que peut-être Hélène ou Pierre, vous vouliez avoir le dernier mot sur cette Maybe question? Maybe Hélène or Pierre, you wanted to have a concluding words? Oh, sorry, Pierre. Just on the preceding question, I want to add a dis distinction. Many foreign laws have defined the obligations of online businesses directly in the law. In Canada, what I wanted to say that because if somebody asked, will it be the same obligations for online businesses as for traditional companies, we still don't know. The bill defines a framework, and after that, it's discretionary for the CR to see after having heard the party. So I would say that for the cultural environment, the law is not all. Its implementation by the CRTC is everything because it's an act of faith concerning the future and concerning what the CRTC will do with all its discretionary powers that are given to it to impose new obligations. And I'll give back the floor to Pierre and his freedom of speech. I don't want to be accused of censoring poor Pierre, especially about this question. So I'll leave you to the concluding words. Well, it's just simply to say that indeed, as it was said, there are laws in all countries, including in Canada, which forbid a certain number of things, you know, racism, hateful, misogynist or sexist comments. So this continues to apply. And obviously, and in all times, the law and broadcasting in Canada never targeted individuals. It's a law which deals with companies. So that's why I think that it's not exaggerated to think to say that after this, you know, to, to think that this law could be used to limit freedom of expression of individuals, it's disinformation because it doesn't resist to a very superficial reading of the law. In other words, any person who reads the law observes that it's not something which is possible. So that's why I, well, I do not hesitate to claim that it's just disinformation. That being said, this type of disinformation in certain countries can have a lot of success and it's often used and to be opposed to measures which target to ensure the diversity, to invoke the freedoms. Well, we see this almost every day, invoke lib freedom in a demagogical way. It can always be used. And unfortunately, while well, I observed that the situation can, well, we're a bit vulnerable to this type of difficulty. Merci beaucoup. Merci énormément à vous trois, Pierre Trudel. Thank you very much to all of you. Hélène, uh, thank you as well. I did little pedigree in the very beginning. I wanted to introduce you. 
but I think that everyone has uh, read the biographies of every uh, presenter. So please, uh, I would encourage you to read them. They're experts on different fields. So let's take a short break. Let's take five minutes. Let's come back at 11.05. We're gonna come back to the second round table. So we'll be back in five minutes. All right, so get yourself a little coffee and let's be right back. Thank you. <laughs> 